This episode of Harvey Brownstone Interviews is brought to you by the Harvey Brownstone Talk Show Blend Coffee, available at hollywoodblends.com. Everyone's saying it's the best coffee they've ever tasted. Why not give it a try and see for yourself? Hello, everyone. I'm Harvey Brownstone, and today's special guest can truly be considered a member of Hollywood royalty. She was a pioneer in the world of entertainment, journalism, and broadcasting with a multifaceted career that spanned many decades. She became a household name through her insightful reporting and signature style in her immensely popular magazine, Rona Barrett's Hollywood, her books, syndicated radio shows, and on television as a host and regular contributor on iconic shows like Good Morning America, The Today Show, and Entertainment Tonight. Because of her excellent network of reliable sources throughout the entertainment industry, she broke countless stories and became the public's trusted insider, documenting the careers and lives of the biggest superstars from the world of movies, music, sports, TV, radio, theater, and even politics. She is beloved and respected not only by the public, but also by the hundreds of celebrities who trusted her to be a liaison between their lives and ours. In the year 2000, our guest decided to deploy her entrepreneurial acumen to address a challenge close to her heart, providing affordable and dignified housing and high quality care for the fastest growing population on the planet, senior citizens. She established the Rona Barrett Foundation, which is a nonprofit organization that operates beautiful seniors residences in California, like the Golden Inn and Village and Harry's House, where residents benefit from a wide range of essential care services in an atmosphere of dignity, respect and love. Our guest has become a renowned advocate for vulnerable seniors, and her wonderful book, Rona Barrett's Grey Matters, and her podcast with the same name have become hugely popular. She's also written two other books, an autobiography called Miss Rona, and a fascinating book entitled How You Can Look Rich and Achieve Sexual Ecstasy. And in 2009, she received a Golden Palm Star on the Palm Springs Walk of Stars. I'm delighted and deeply honored to welcome the legendary Rona Barrett to our show. Miss Barrett, thank you so much for being here. Thank you. Thank you. So here we are. I, I just didn't know what to do and what to say in the beginning because most people may not even know who I am in the rest of the country. I've had more letters from uh, other national countries than from my own America. No, but I used to get a lot of mail. And um, now that I'm taking care of so many seniors or what I consider a, a large amount of seniors and wanting the rest of the country here, here in the United States to start in each of their little cities, in their areas, and almost anything in that they can think of to take a senior and give them a home, make sure that they can be taken care of. Everything you think that a person should have that you would want for yourself. And that's what we've been trying to do. So I'll get that out of the way. And now you can ask me a question or two about the world that I worked so hard to get into and couldn't wait to get out. So here well, we are. You know, I'm definitely going to be asking you about your work with seniors. But I have to tell you, as someone who interviews celebrities, that it's such a thrill to have you on our show, Miss Barrett, because you were the first person who inspired me to do what I'm doing. Thank you for being such a great role model for so many people. Well, I'm so happy to know you. May I call you Harvey? Oh, please do. Can I call you Rona? Definitely. Oh, that would be lovely. Well, Rona, when you first started out organizing fan clubs for popular singers like Eddie Fisher and Steve Lawrence, and then you went to work for Frankie Avalon's manager, did you ever think at that time that you would become a celebrity yourself? I don't think you think that way, but maybe you want to be known to be that way. I don't, I just, I just wanted to make a success of myself. I just wanted to make sure that I could do something that would benefit other people and that they would enjoy what I was enjoying, that they could enjoy it too. 
Well, you've often been compared to the legendary Luella Parsons and Hedda Hopper. Were they your role models or did you try to do things differently than them? Oh, they weren't my role models. I'll tell you that, Harvey. They really were not. <clears throat> of course, I knew them and I met them when I moved to Hollywood. But they, first of all, they were old enough to be my parents and then some. So no, that I, I didn't necessarily, I, I would just like to not be called a child who had a, a disability, which is what I was born with. And I could not do a lot of the things that other children could do. And they used to call me names sometimes, you know, because they didn't know better. And I didn't know how to protect myself at, in those early days of my life. So I can't say that wanting to really be a celebrity only was when I started to really make a difference and that I would break stories that I thought the public should know. And and it wasn't, you know, I, I made my mistakes in my early uh, television days. There were so few women at that time that were on television and were doing anything that I might be doing, and uh, suddenly the uh, the bosses at ABC, in particular, which finally gave me my my break. It just their ratings, which were quite low in those days, suddenly started going up and up and up and up, and that if I was driving a car, I and I would stop at a red light. I could see somebody, you know, rolling down a window and they say, hey, you Rona? Yeah, sure. Oh, OK, thanks, girl. You know, and then they back up, the window would go. And uh, there I was sitting there and saying, oh, my God, people are recognizing me through a, a car window. And it, it was just a whole different life. And then you had to learn how to how to protect yourself, how to protect your career, how to get along with other people. And and that's how I spent my life. My first, I would think it was, I'm, I was on television 40 years. Yeah, you were. And I think of all the skills that you just mentioned, the one that you were best known and respected for was getting <clears throat> major stars to open up to you and trust you the way they did. Was there a particular technique you used? Because you were brilliant at it. I th Well, no. There was nothing that I knew how to do because I'd never done it before. But I was interested. And they could tell in my eyes that I wanted to know something about them. And I didn't want to know, well, I'm doing this picture and it's starring this and then I'm so excited about it. I know the part's going to be wonderful. And then something would say to me, why would it be so wonderful? Who are you going to be playing? And I would ask a question like that. And I say, well, what kind of a role is it? Do you know this person? And then next thing you know, was there anything in your life so far that you could say, oh my God, I'm reading something and I, I it's all about me now. But it, what I meant by me, me the, the, the artist that was talking to me. And so it became like two people who were just sitting there with a cup of tea, a cup of coffee, a roll or something. And we would just start saying something and then they would somebody would say I don't know what they would say they would say well the first time I had a hard time was when I first met my first girlfriend and and uh, she wanted to get married right away or something like that and it brought up other questions in that subject matter and before I knew it somebody was blurting out that he accidentally or she accidentally got pregnant or something like that. It wasn't that I was asking that question. It's just that it came from them first, sometimes, most of the time. So well, you, I just, I just, that's, that was it. If you don't like people, don't do this kind of a job. 
if you're really interested in people and you really want to know what is in their heart and what isn't it what what is in their head then you have to become your own psychologist and psychiatrist and 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 good friend well it was really the thing that made you so respected and admired and the one that we wanted to watch on TV. Is there one interview, Rona, that stands out in your memory as being a particular favorite? Hmm. I would have to say it was the time I went to interview Cher and I was going to be doing my first big special. Well, it was a TV special and this was the first time that they gave me the opportunity to do something. And I wanted to do then do four of the most exciting and important women in Hollywood. And so one of the women was also at one time uh, was uh, Raquel Welsh. And so uh, Raquel Welsh said, would say to me, Oh, Rona, I can't do this. I just can't do this. I, I don't want to. took me eight months to convince her to be one of the women that I was going to interview on this first special. And you want me to tell you who the other two people on that special were to prove to you what a fan I am? Uh, yes, go ahead. But I know, I think I do know. <laughs> but you, go ahead. You, you interviewed Raquel Welch, Raquel, yeah. Liza Minnelli, yeah. <laughs> Cher, and Anne Margaret. Isn't that right? Anne Margaret, that's correct. And it Absolutely. was that it was, I can tell you, it was one of the highest rated TV specials of the year. It was long before Barbara Walters started doing these one on one interviews. Whatever gave you the idea to do those specials? because I wanted to know who the people that, how do you relate to these people and go see them in the movies and what the movie was all about and, 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 and who were they? How did they get to be famous also? How, how did it happen? So part of it is now I can say to me, it is God given. Yeah. Well, what was it about the interview with Cher that, stands well, out it's so special that was that was really because with with my crew around me they all said well gee the living room is beautiful and she was you know she had bought the house that jane mansfield had and and so it was, it was nice she said oh no let's know how how about doing the interview up on my bed <laughs> I, my mouth opened, the, the whole staff's mouth opened uh, of all places, a bedroom and her bedroom. And and so I went up the stairs and the, the crew followed me and she plopped onto the bed and I plopped on there with her. And, and suddenly we just started talking. And it was magic because you, it was so intimate. It's like she forgot that there was a camera there and we were right. getting to see who she really was. It's true, Harvey. It was true. And that was what I, what I hoped for. I just wanted people to get to know some people the way I was getting to know them. And, and the only way I knew how to do it is either to, to bring a little bit of something that happened to me that is happening to them too. And then they'd open it up. And so, I don't know. So was born the Rona Barrett interviewer. <laughs> well, I distinctly remember the interview you did with Betty Davis, very near the <gasps> end of her life. It was extraordinary. She specifically told you beforehand that she did not want to talk about her daughter who had written a terrible book about her, but then on her own, Sorry, with, can't get without, over you. <laughs> without being asked about it, she started talking about her daughter. What did you make of that, Rona? I was dumbfounded to tell you the truth. And I was saying in my head, my God, she begged me never to ask her questions that would bring up this subject matter. And here she is. She's giving it to me. 
and that was that was it and then we continued on and we, wherever wherever she decided to go i mean to a degree that's where i took her and then would ask the questions that i think other people would like to know well i want to tell you something that, that one of the reasons i wanted to have you on the show is because one of my dearest friends is the assistant that was working with Betty Davis for the last 10 years of her life. Her name was Catherine Cermak, who's a very dear friend. And she told me something about you that touched me so deeply. After the interview, you asked her, would you like my photographer to take a picture of you with Miss Davis? And that is the only picture she has of herself with Betty Davis. And that is the picture that is on the back of Betty Davis's book, her last book. And it was because of you. So she asked me to thank you for that. My pleasure. My pleasure. Thank her. Now, another one of my favorite Rona Barrett interviews was your conversation with Lucille Ball. Somehow, you got her to open up about the impact on her own job satisfaction and sense of self-worth of losing her mother, who had been there for every single taping of The Lucy Show. That was just so poignant, Rona. I, it gives me shivers still. You're bringing back big, big memories for me. And, oh, I loved Lucy. And and I don't want to say that I loved everybody that I interviewed. But when people were willing to give something to you, to allow you to go into that very personal part of their life, how can you not love somebody and also learn something? I didn't know all the answers. I didn't know that she may be unhappy. I mean, I may have had it, or I may have had people say to me, oh, you know, Lucy's not in a good mood right now. Lucy is this, or, or Barbara is this. And it, it's just not how it works. It just does how it works. You either have to, uh, the difficult ones are the men. The men were more difficult than the women? Oh, yes. Why? Women are... are you tell me why. Well, I didn't find, I haven't found that. I mean, I thought Robert Wagner was so sweet and so nice. I, I, that hasn't been my experience, but maybe, is it because you're a woman yourself? Well, I think it's, yes. And they, they could tell that I, I, there, there was something that, that brought us together um, that moment. And I believe after eight months trying to get Raquel Welch and Cher came in at the last minute because his, her wonderful PR person was a wonderful friend to me. And I don't know if I'm going to say the right thing right now, but I want to tell you something. I believe that when I was talking to a lot of the male actors, a number of them were also hiding the fact that they were gay. I always felt that. That's that's the truth. And that because of that, this was in a way breaking into the, that part of the mind of the person that most people would never get to know, would never get to even it would even think of asking that question, but it it uh, it seemed to me the ones who were always willing to open up after I was able to say, I I remember one interview I had with, oh the the boys from the the, the, the television show, and he his father was a a, a, a preacher, and. I, I said, now, how do I interview a preacher's son? What do I say to him? What do I do? And so I asked him that question right out. I'm, I'm not implying about gay here, but um, I'm saying, how do, you, how, do you, how do you get to be a friend to your father, a pre preacher, a pastor? A, and, and, and well, whatever it was that I said, it just hit him right between the eyes. And he said, Rona, my life was very difficult. 
He says, really being the son of a preacher who's very well known in our particular part of the country is, is, it was, is very hard. My father really never understood me. My, you know, and all of those things that many women would talk about, but he talked about it. And then a lot of other men. And I remember I was doing, doing a big special with uh, Michael, Michael, not, not Michael Douglas. It's Michael Landon. Not Michael Landon was like my kid brother. Really? Yeah. Yes. He was one of the first pre pre people, young Hollywood people that I met. And he was already married to a woman named Dodie. And Dodie had a child. And, uh, and Michael was handsome. He was sweet. He was interesting. He was funny. And and it was misunderstood for a while by, I think, his father, too. And it was always a boy, who, a man who was having difficulties in his early life, getting to know a parent. And so, I don't know, so I, so I used myself sometimes and said, you know, how do you work? How did I work with my father? My father never wanted me to even leave his house. So, so... Uh, and 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 being a child, I think you might know. I I was born with a very strange condition, but it was it belonged to muscular dystrophy, and so I could not run or walk right right way and everything. And so kids used to call me names and things like that. So, uh, but I used those things in order to ask somebody a question because I would then say. Well, I had something like that happen in my life, and this is sort of tell me, tell me really about it. You know, what what did your mother say? What did your dad say? What did this one say? What did they say? What did your friends say? Did you have any friends? Who were your friends? How did you make the friends? And I mean, it would, it would be as if you and I were really right together, and I can hold your hand, and I would say, Harvey. Tell me the real story about Harvey Brownstone. And even now that you're not doing that anymore, I still feel it. I still feel that ability to penetrate through the facade. So let me ask you, Rona, since you mentioned that sometimes you felt a celebrity was hiding a secret and it, you know, it could be that they were gay or maybe they're having an affair with someone or maybe they're unhappy in their marriage. Do you believe that journalists should invade the privacy and make announcements? Let's say that you found out that Rock Hudson was gay before anybody else. Would you have disclosed that or not? No, I, I, I had that opportunity, but I never did it. And then that was because I never felt that something that personal should be spoken by somebody else as a story or but be made fun of. Or, or, or do something that could hurt them more. And so I stayed away from that. I just, I just those, those actors who knew now that I knew them and everything, they ne I didn't have that kind of trouble any longer. I mean, sure, you meet a couple of people who are really not nice anyway. So, but I don't know. That was that was my lucky thing that I I think that if and I think it's because of my own situation of of, of about not being somebody who could you know run a race. Uh, I I could never do that. And or sometimes when people would say, oh, "Oh, can I help you up the stairs? What's the matter?" And I said, "Oh, oh no, nothing. I just had a little accident with my with my legs." And I can't do it. And I'm so, oh, let me help you. And I said, no, please, just thank you very much. I appreciate it. But I'm not, I'm, I'm not dying. <laughs> so, so, you know, I think that because you were, you felt like you were on the outside looking in at that world, that that's why we identified with you. We in the audience, because we were on the outside for a very different reason. 
But I really do think that the fact that you were not a show business kid, you were not an advantaged, entitled young lady, you were on the outside giving us a window into who these people were. And I'll tell you, nobody did it better. Can I tell you another really great show that you did that I just loved? What? It was called That's My Mom. You had Kenny oh. Rogers, Christy McNichol, Larry Hagman, and Bo Derek with their mothers. And then you had your own mother on the show. That must have been so special for you. Well, my, when I said to my mother, Mom, the producer would really like me to interview you a little bit. Uh, she said, ah, don't start with me, please. Uh, well, <clears throat> that was my mother. My mother was, and then when she started to talk, and then I said, Mom, I've got to cut you off because we have somebody else <laughs> that has to come on. And she said, but it was just a few minutes. What are you talking about? <laughs> And I and I I just knew she was an adorable lady, an adorable lady. My father was an adorable man, and I named my building one of my buildings after my dad. Rona, did your parents ever tell you how proud they were of you with with how far you came in this business? They never said it to me. Never, but. They, but no, they never said it to me, really. They never. But but it was to the rest of the family or it was to friends, you know, because it was the friends then would come back and say, do you know I had dinner with your mother and father and, you know, your father all night long was just talking about my Rona was doing this and my Rona's doing that. And my mother said, oh, yes, she's after, she just bought a beautiful house and blah, 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 blah. We're going to go out to visit her and so forth and so on. And that was it. <laughs> now, I, I'm hesitating to ask you this. It's up to you Don't. if you want to answer it. But you interviewed Donald Trump way back in 1980. What did you think of him back then? Yes, I did an interview with him. And it was also for a special about how did they grow up knowing that their parents were exceedingly wealthy and they, they could have all the money in the world and whatever, and he, he avoided it. But I asked him a lot of other questions. And so he just answered them. And what did you think of him? I think he wasn't telling me a lot of things. I just I just never felt that he he was giving me all the answers. I just didn't feel it. But when the interview was over, he sat there next to me and he said to me, that was a very good interview, Rona. I wow. didn't think I was going to get anything like that from you. And that was that was it. And and I said, ah, I have one last question. If you now know you have enough money to take care of everyone in your family, friends, everyone, that you're the richest person in the world or close to it. And I said, and you lost all your money. What would you do? And he just stopped like this and said, I'll become the first president of the United States. Wow. What a moment. Wow. Let me ask you, were there times when your legal department tried to persuade you not to cover a story? It wasn't. Well, I would I would say they would say, Ron, is there another way that you can take this story? I mean, because, you know, and you, you know, there was something there that, but it wasn't maybe the time to come out. The one that I really think about is, was really a difficult one. It was Mary Tyler Moore. And it was, uh, it was, she had just done what I thought was one of the best movies and the best parts that I had ever seen her do. And that was 
ordinary, ordinary people. people. Right. And so we had did this interview and during this period, I think it was either the the day, a couple of days later that her son had killed himself. Yeah. And it was, it was, it was, and, uh, but I had never seen Mary be as, as uh, outspoken as she had been the day we sat down and I had to fly to New York to do the interview because uh, that's where she was at that moment. And I, and the only place time to time that she could do these kind of an interviews, it, it was a, some, something to do in New York City that you you could not ask questions and some things and they had their I don't know what what do you want to call it now but then you just couldn't ask those kinds of, of questions and I said but you can't this is going to be my opening night on NBC with this with it with this interview and the two other interviews and. The next thing I knew is I got a phone call from Grant Tinker. I was at the beauty parlor. I'll never forget it. And I, 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 my, the, la the lady says, I've got a phone call here. And I said, hello, hello. And he said, Rona, it's, it's Grant Tinker. And I said, Grant, what are you doing? Why are you calling me? And he said, Rona. You're not going on the air with this show, this interview with Mary. I said, well, you're not married to her any longer. And she gave me this interview. I, I, you know, I didn't tear it out of her. And, and it's a wonderful interview. He says, yes, it's too wonderful. And I don't want you to do it. And you're not going to do it. And we're taking it off the air. We're not going to go with it. And I was left uh, with a, uh, this was a new show that was going to be with Tom Snyder and myself. And that, and somehow it dissipated. And all day until the evening when the show went live, I had to look for somebody else to, to do an interview with in order to uh, bring the show back to its, <laughs> what it was supposed to be. But I, that was the only time that I was ever told by anyone, you cannot do that interview and I'm not allowing you go. And, and I said, but you can't do that. I said, you just can't do that, Grant. You know, it's it, your wife, ex-wife gave it to, this interview to me. She wanted this thing to air. So I called Mary afterwards and, and, and I was, you know, she said, let it alone. That was it. So I never went on the air with that interview, but it was it was a really exquisite interview, if I have to say so myself, because she wanted at that moment in her life to say something about the not a, the the movie in particular and how much she saw herself in that movie. And so, if anybody ever wanted to really know a little bit more about her. That's the movie is the only one. It had nothing to do with the television series, although I'm quite sure that was a cover up for the things that she couldn't say and do in her life. And because a lot of actors and actresses often do that. They want to hide mm -hmm. that part of them. And so they'll go to a subject matter or something that is so different. It, uh, but it tells you something a, a great deal. And so if you remember it, you ask those questions later on, maybe you'll get the answers. My Lord, this interview is like a master class. I'm telling you, do, I wonder whatever happened to that footage of your interview with Mary. Do you know where it is? Well, it might be on a reel <laughs> with something else. Uh, at NBC. I don't know anymore. I don't know where it was. I did, by the way, get to do another interview with Mary. And, but it wasn't the same. It, it, there was always like the two of us knew there was a dark point. And, and, but it was a wonderful interview because people were saying, God, that was some interview. And, but it was nothing like what the first one was. 
because the first one also had to do with the sun. Boy. And it was so, it was, you know, it's, it's, it's very hard to watch somebody struggle and feel everything that they have in themselves and reveal it on television where, you know, it is like having surgery. <laughs> it is, that's for sure. Tell me, Rona, how did you deal with situations when some celebrities like Frank Sinatra, Ryan O'Neill, they objected to the things you said about them? How did you deal with that? <laughs> well, one thing was that all the Sinatra, well, the two Sinatra daughters and their son, they all thought of me as a, a, a friend of the family and and their mother. I was always having dinner or on the weekends or something with Mrs. Sinatra, who was no longer the real Mrs. Sinatra. And I don't know, somewhere along the line, somebody said to uh, to Frank, that's enough, cut it out. And I can't say, I'll let you use your very smart head that remembers a lot of things. But I had many friends or acquaintances, I should say, in the world that Frank walked in and father, you know, he, he was he was old enough to be my father. He was, you know, older than my father. I mean, we were Nancy, Nancy Jr. and I were really best, best friends through her marriage with the singer and it, it it would really it really I just didn't because Mrs. Sinatra then suddenly turned on me she's the one who turned on me and it was just very difficult for both of the girls to know how to be a friend with me anymore because that was where the poison came from in my opinion, but that was it. That was it. But I, I just handled it. And I always, I didn't look for bad things to say about Frank. I used to say wonderful things. I, I would say, I think he's deserving of getting this thing or that thing or whatever. And I would just go on. And so, you know, now and then we had to run into each other. And I remember him, you know, saying, something in, in the beginning when I first really met him at the house for Christmas and they were having their big Christmas party and I was at the piano and I was just tinkling and he walked by and he says that's good he said I said well I'm Rona I'm Nancy's friend and he said good girl good girl good girl well, I wish she told me that she was bringing a friend. I would have gotten you a present. That's what I remember Frank saying to me that night. <laughs> wow, that's so sweet. Is it true that Ryan O'Neill sent you a live tarantula? We didn't know it was. We didn't know it was him that sent it, but it, it, he did. He did send it because he's. It was you know. I don't have to tell you about the boy. Man's gone now and. I, I had my issues with him, and uh, they in, involved a, a lot of things that a lot of people were doing in those days. It was drugs and other things, and and they they chose people who really weren't you know good for them, and and they were always having fights and and publicly. So it was when it was when they did something publicly, it was my job to report it. It, it wasn't that I was making up that they had a fight or they hit somebody or they did this. I didn't do that. I tried never to do that. So that was it. Well, thank God the tarantula never got near you. That's for sure. Oh, it did. It came close because my, my secretary at the time, we didn't know what happened. We had a box sent to us. We, we said, who sent the box? We don't know. What should we do? Is it going to be a bum or is it going to be something ridiculous or something? So my my secretary said, 
Okay, let's open it. So we opened up the boxes and inside was a tennis can. And inside the tennis can was this creature oh, crawling out. That creature came out of that bottle of whether that can or whatever it was and dropped dead. Oh. It dropped dead just as it got out. It walked out and 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 just died. Thank God. You know, Rona, when you were in the broadcasting industry in the 70s and 80s, you were a woman operating very much in a man's world. And I sometimes got the feeling that you had to deal with a lot of professional jealousy from people like Roger Grimsby and Tom Snyder. Am I right? Yes, you were right. You were right. They, they were jealous. I'm they so sorry. Jealous. I'm just so sorry you had to go through that. You're a real but pioneer. But 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 you have to go through those things. I never knew when they were going to happen. But sometimes, you know, I mean, it could they could break a little part of your heart off. I don't I don't know why. I mean, they thought I was doing something stupid. They they didn't think it was deserving of being on television. That was the whole thing in a nutshell. And I was a woman and there and and they didn't like it when they would say they went. I remember somebody telling one of my other head guys went to a party and, he's, and they said, oh, you better tell me a little bit about Rona Barrett. I'm dying to know about Rona Barrett. And, you know, he came into the office the next day and he said to me, well, I got an air full. And I said, what happened? He says, I went to this party last night and all these women there were asking me only about you. I said, you mean they don't want to know anything about you? And so, and he said, I guess not. And then he started. He was jealous. Know. Yeah, well, he was he was also saying a lot of other things that a lot of people didn't know about sources and friends that I had who were always willing to help me find the right answers. And my interest in Hollywood changed also. I love to do these wonderful longer interviews, but I, I, I wasn't interested in really just saying so-and-so is going to be in this next picture and this is what's happening over here and so forth and so on. I wanted to know a lot more about who was doing what to whom in the industry. And that was what I was interested in. I was more becoming far more interested in the financial part of Hollywood and how people really worked and functioned. And I started to tell the you know, public, you know, Hollywood is not just made up of pretty people. They are also made up of people that you read about in the newspapers and in magazines and people who write books and so forth and so on. And therefore I I I don't I think I sort of started to lose a little bit of my own audience because they were far more interested in when I would put a pretty face up on the screen and say, this is doing this and this and this. And this and that's it. Well, you know what I think when I was watching you and when I would talk to people about what you did for all of us, we felt that you witnessed the real behavior of celebrities. You saw good behavior. You saw bad behavior. You knew about people throwing tantrums, taking drugs, treating people badly, acting very immaturely. And I've always wanted to ask you this, Rona, have you ever been able to figure out why some celebrities who worked so hard to become stars just could not handle being famous? Because you have to have. <laughs> I don't know. You have to have a lot of 
feelings about yourself in order to understand what, what might be going on in the mind and in the heart of uh, someone who has, is, uh, is starting to behave in a manner that no one should behave. And so... But they, I had become, a lot of, they become their own worst enemies. After they became they, their own worst men, enemies that, that kind of forced me and others because they were doing things publicly to talk about the pub, pub, public things that they were doing that, 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 you know, I guess everybody wants to know something bad about somebody. And then they feel, ah, guess what? I know who he really is. I know who she really is. Oh, you know who she slept with? Oh, you know who he slept with? Oh, you know, and, and it was always about the same thing that everybody talks about. But I had famous people's names attached to it sometimes, you know, so. There must have been some celebrities that you really did admire for the way they lived their lives. Yes, a lot of them. But even those that I did know that well, I also knew they were. It was like knowing that Lucille Ball at one point was not very happy. It was knowing that Raquel Welch at some point was this, that and the other thing. I don't want to talk about anybody who has just passed on, but it's you grow up and something happened in my own life, I guess, that made me say, I haven't finished what I'm supposed to do, but I can't do it in the manner that I think the public really would like to hear it because they don't realize that I know things like this. And so, I said, I'm closing shop. I'm calling it quits. And I'm going to find a new life for myself. And thank God you did. I mean, look at the Rona Barrett Foundation. What inspired you to become an advocate for seniors and to create the foundation? Because my parents were getting old, older. I had relatives that were older. I had a lot of friends who were older. I had a lot of movie stars who were older. And I had I knew so many people who had lost themselves in the world, in the world that they were living. It's so hard to have a big name and one day realize, oh, this this role that somebody I, I read of this in a book or in the in a script. Oh, I know what I could do with that piece. And knowing because you're not that person that you once used to be and no one wants to take a chance with you, that you lose the job, you don't get the job, you never have the opportunity to then show really what you could do and that you weren't always a, a, a man who went out fighting, you know, and stalking somebody and, you know, in the, in the face and so forth and so on. And that was it. That was it for me. I just decided I needed a new life. And I and what I saw, too, were all, all these older people. And when I moved away from Hollywood, I had people who came to visit me and they would say, oh, Rona, I don't know what to do. I don't know what to do. So-and-so is, is having really hard times. And uh, I said, what do they need? And they said they they need more food. They need they need somebody to sort of take care of them. And as all of these things started in my life, I realized who's doing this for anyone who's a senior? What happens when we don't have a lot of money? How does the money disappear? Where does it go? What do you do? And so suddenly... I got myself involved in in a, in a small town's wonderful place, and they needed help at the hospital. They needed you know things to be done. They needed more people, so I used myself if they needed me to to talk about the problems that they were having or the having in in a community or wherever else I might be. And so I one day I said. 
this is not going where I really would like it to go. I said, I need to show somebody what you have to do if you want to handle a senior and you want to make their lives better and never, and take take away some of the things that you always hear people say, oh, he's old, she's old. Oh, what well, you know, you don't have to worry about them. And that's what America has done to many older people. They have just washed them away. Now they're old, can't do this, don't have the money, and they don't have the money. And, and in the end, it's, a lot of it has to do with money and what you do with your money and how people can help you. It's not always about money. It's always about the ability for when the men and women who would see me struggling walking up the stairs of the of the um of the of the uh, trains trains you know they would um maybe it's, i would say you know there really are a lot of lovely people in this world and and and, a, and another way to make them feel secure is i've got to build something and so like where where I could take care of somebody or somebody could, you know, take care of me. I don't know. And that's how I got involved. And I found people, people who, including builders who wanted to get involved with Rona Barrett and Rona Barrett and, and the hospitals and the little uh, the, the hotels and things that she was working on. And it was wonderful when I finally was able... A, a, a man called me and he said to me, I got a telephone call this morning and the man wanted to know if how well I knew you. And I, and I said, well, I, I know her. And he said, would you give her a message for me? And I said, okay. And he said, would you tell her that I would like to build a facility with her for seniors. And I said, you're lying to me to the sky. I said, you're kidding me. He said, no, 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 I'm telling you, it's the truth. And who the man was, was the president of our local community in Santa Barbara, who was a builder and was in charge of all the kind of buildings you could build. And I think, I think the next week I met him. And two weeks later, we signed a little contract, nothing big and great. And we started to, uh, and, I, and I knew where I wanted to put this building. And it was going, every two minutes was going on sale, back on the market, on sale, back on the market. And so one day, after six months, three years waiting for this piece of property to sell, nobody did it. So I said, I'm going to find some people who have some, enough money to buy it for me or help me. And I did. And that's how I got to build Rona Barrett's foundation. And that's how I, how I really moved on. And, uh, the man who had called to find out if he, if, uh, if uh, and this other man who was an architect, if he really knew me, <laughs> said, don't forget, I want to be your partner. And that was it. And since then, 12, 14, 15 years now have gone by. And uh, my life has changed completely. Well, and, and look uh, what you've done to change other people's lives. I mean, you're... I know you're based in California, but you're advocating for your model of seniors' residences to be made available everywhere in America, correct? Harvey, can you t talk about me every single day to your audience and tell them I'd love to help them and I want to see that every every older person who can, does not have a lot of money needs food, needs somebody else to love them wants to build another Rona Barrett place. We have the Golden Inn and Village, and now we have Harry's house. And I'm hoping that one day, if God lets me live a little longer, 
I will have another building up or something and show what we really can do to see our seniors. Because when I was growing up, everybody knew you came to 50 years old, your life was over. They didn't expect you to live much longer. That is not the case. And uh, now we're faced with other issues, which I will not go into with you because I know you know what I'm talking about. And I pray to God that the people who don't believe that life can go on with a very, in a very wonderful way and that you don't have to think about dying today because somebody else doesn't want you here. Well, I just think you are such an icon. And, you know, you mentioned earlier that you have to like people to do what you did for so many years. Well, if anybody ever doubted that you like people, Rona, look at what you've done for so many hundreds of seniors, vulnerable seniors, I might add. To, so you definitely can be sure that everyone knows you don't just like people, you really care about the quality of life of seniors, people who seem to have been dismissed or discarded in life. I hope that we get a Rona Barrett Foundation seniors residence in every community. I am on your side and by your side. I cannot thank you enough for taking the time to talk with me about your amazing career, about the foundation. Rona, thank you for taking the time to appear on our show. Thank you. I, I will always now remember Harvey Brownstone. Thank you for wanting to have me. And uh, Harvey, take good care of yourself. And I hope we see each other again. I sure hope so. You're welcome anytime. Our guest has been the legendary Rona Barrett. You can learn more about the Rona Barrett Foundation by going to their official website, ronabarrettfoundation.org. And Ms. Barrett's book entitled Rona Barrett's Gray Matters is available on Amazon and wherever books are sold. My name is Harvey Brownstone. Thank you to my producer, Steve Silver, my director of programming, Deborah Batsafin, my production assistant, Rosa Puzo, my PR directors, Eileen Shapiro and Jimmy Starr, and my entire team at the XPTV1 Network in the UK. Thank you all for joining us. See you next time. Thanks for watching. Be sure to check out all the great interviews on the Harvey Brownstone Interviews YouTube channel. Don't forget to subscribe and ring the bell to be notified when new videos are posted.